Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us on today's NASA Google Plus Hangout. We're very excited to celebrate a very important and special occasion. It's the 15th anniversary, or birthday, so to speak, of the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Almost exactly 15 years ago, on July 23, 1999, the Space Shuttle Columbia took off from the Kennedy Space Flight Center just after midnight. At the helm of the mission, known as STS-93, was Eileen Collins, the first woman ever to lead a NASA mission into space. STS-93 was also historic for what was in Columbia's payload bay, the Chandra X-ray Observatory. The Chandra X-ray Observatory is NASA's crown jewel for X-ray astronomy. Na Chandra is also one of NASA's great observatories, along with the Hubble Space Telescope, Spitzer Space Telescope, and Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. The Chandra X-ray Observatory has exquisite X-ray resolution and sensitivity, which allows it to see objects such as the debris from exploded stars, matter falling into black holes, and galaxy clusters that are filled with hot gas. We are very fortunate to have a distinguished panel of guests today to explain and explore Chandra's 15 years in space and in science. In fact, these are some of the people who conceived of, built and developed, and tested Chandra on the ground. We also have guests who are actively using Chandra to better explore our universe today and continues to make scientific discoveries. Before I introduce our panelists, though, I do want to bring up a graphic that will display two websites that have a wealth of information that you can explore during today's Google Plus Hangout. If I can have those two graphics with those two URLs, there's the nasa.gov slash chandra and also chandra.si.edu slash 15. And also, if you are interested in asking a question today, you may use the Ask NASA hashtag or leave a comment on the Google, events, uh, Google Plus events page. Now let's meet our speakers. Harvey Tannenbaum is a senior astrophysicist at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and also the former director of the Chandra X-ray Center. Stephen O'Dell is the deputy project scientist for Chandra at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Julie Blavacek Larondo is an assistant professor of physics at the University of Montreal in Canada. And Scott Wolk is an astrophysicist also at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. Uh, without any further ado, let me turn it over to Harvey to get us started. Harvey? Thanks, Megan. It's really great to be here today and have a chance to talk about Chandra, which of course is very, very special to me. Uh, from 1991 until this past uh, April, I was the uh, director of the Chandra X-ray Center here in Cambridge. And prior to that, I had led the team of SAO scientists and engineers who worked with Marshall Space Flight Center to oversee this mission from its inception nearly 40 years ago. So there's a real long history there. We have this first animation. This is a picture showing that Chandra, in fact, is a space mission. Uh, we have to fly above the Earth's atmosphere in order to be able to detect X-rays from stars and galaxies. Uh, when we get up above the atmosphere to image an X-ray source, we need a very special kind of telescope. We need to be able to image X-rays, and to do that, we take the inside walls of cylindrical shaped mirrors, we bounce or scatter the x-rays, reflect the x-rays from those inside walls, and after two reflections we get a, a very nice image about 30 feet down the road in the case of Chandra. The mirrors are so precisely uh, shaped and, and smoothly polished for Chandra that the x-ray images that we obtain are ten times better than any previous x-ray telescope was able to get. Now, as I mentioned, Chandra's flying about a thousand miles, thousands of miles above the Earth, so servicing's not really practical. The original hardware, though, is really working amazingly well 15 years after launch, and our engineering team at Northrop Grumman has recently completed an analysis that suggests that at least another decade in orbit, and perhaps even longer, is feasible. So we're looking forward to lots more beautiful images and sparkling science results from Chandra. One of the uh, questions we were asked often before launch was what do we expect to do scientifically with Chandra? And we often gave a fairly short answer. We'd say uh, black holes, dark matter, exploding stars, and colliding galaxies. In a flippant sort of way, we were highlighting the dark side and the cosmic violence in the universe. And Chandra's come through in those areas and lots and lots of ones that we perhaps didn't even anticipate at the time uh, before launch. Uh, one of the areas that's really important for Chandra is exploding stars or supernovae. And this uh, second uh, graphic 
shows a uh, release uh, that just uh, came out uh, in the last day or so of uh, four supernova remnants. The reason they're really uh, fantastic to study in x-rays is after the explosion, uh, what Chandra is able to see is a blast wave of material firing out into space. It's able to see superheated clouds of debris and ejecta, things that are either from the star or swept up by the aftermath of the explosion, and also the rotating neutron star in the middle, which can generate tremendous amount of energy. So there's a lot of science on supernova remnants. Uh, three of these four in this image are rather young. We're seeing them between 500 and 1,000 years after the explosion. But the one in the upper center of the image is actually uh, about a factor of 10 old or several thousand years uh, after the explosion. Now, it's one of only three in our Milky Way galaxy that's known to have a large amount of oxygen in the uh, supernova remnant. And, of course, oxygen is very important. Understanding where it comes from and how it's dispersed is very important for tracing at least life as we know it here uh, on Earth. Uh, besides taking pictures, Chandra is always also very good at imaging uh, uh, in specific energies, at measuring the energy of the x-rays that it, it's taking the pictures for. And from the x-ray energy, we can actually map the different elements. So in this particular image of G292, oxygen uh, lines, x-rays are, are highlighted in yellow and orange. Uh, green corresponds to uh, silicon, no, green corresponds to magnesium, and blue corresponds to silicon and sulfur. So you can see how the different elements are distributed across the remnant, and certainly uh, it looks different in different uh, lines. If we look to the uh, upper right of this image, uh, you see the remnant of the supernova explosion detected by Tycho Brahe, the famous astronomer in 1572. Uh, besides studying all the debris, Chandra's actually made a very interesting discovery seeing a stripe-like pattern off to one edge, which is an indication that protons are being accelerated to very high energies in those regions. And that may be the explanation, or at least one of the major sources of mysterious cosmic rays, showing where they're accelerated and how they acquire their energy. So again, uh, Chandra probing at what we call extreme physics. Now, what about dark matter? If we uh, go to the next graphic, uh, this is a composite image of the uh, famous uh, bullet cluster. It gets its nickname of the bullet cluster. If you look at the x-rays in pink, which come from Chandra, you can see it looks like a bullet off to the right side of the x-ray part of the image. Uh, now, uh, uh, this is a composite, and data from uh, optical telescopes, the light that comes from stars and galaxies is seen by Hubble and by ground-based telescope is shown in uh, white and yellow. And further, we use what's called gravitational lensing. We actually are able to use the distortion that's introduced in the images of even further away galaxies, galaxies that are seen behind the cluster. When we look through the intervening material in the cluster, the gravity from the cluster material distorts the shape of those background galaxies. And by studying that, we can actually map the gravity field and the matter that's generating the gravity in the cluster. And that's shown in blue. And what you should see in this image is that the blue, most of the gravity is coming from material which is offset, which is spatially located different from the pink, which is the ordinary matter, the hot gas that generates the x-rays. And so with Chandra and with this lensing data, we actually are seeing this effect where the bullets slammed through the uh, central part of the uh, main cluster perhaps a hundred million years ago, more or less, and uh, it caused the gas to slow down and the dark matter kept on going at the speed at which it was moving. And so what we see by this separation, by the blue being truly distinct from the pink, is that we can't explain away or dismiss the possibility of dark matter by somehow trying to modify the laws of gravity uh, as they would correspond to the ordinary, the pink material, the, the hot gas. A dark matter is real, and in this image we can see how it's distinct and separate from the ordinary matter. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve O'Dell. Okay, th thank you, Harvey. As uh, Harvey mentioned, SAO and MSFC have collaborated for nearly 40 years on what has become the Chandra X-ray Observatory. I came to MSFC in 1987 to work what was then called the Advanced X-ray Astrophysics Facility, or ACSAF. 
Martin Weiskopf, the project scientist, arrived at MSFC about a decade earlier in 1977, about one year after Ricardo Giacconi and Harvey had convinced NASA to initiate a study that eventually led to the Chandra mission. Besides serving as NASA's managing center for the Chandra mission, MSFC provided facilities for and coordinated the calibration on the ground of the Chandra X-ray observatory system. The observatory system includes the high-resolution mirror assembly, two focal plane detectors, and two grading arrays which allow for precise determination of the energy of X-ray photons. The first photo shows an aerial view of the X-ray calibration facility, or XRCF, where scientists and engineers from SAO, MSFC, the science instrument teams, and industry partners calibrated the Chandra observing system. This calibration was a 24-7 operation over nearly six months, starting in 1996, December. X-rays from the source building in the upper left travel a half a kilometer or one-third of a mile within an evacuated tube to a large vacuum chamber inside the building on the lower right, which houses the instrument chamber. The next photo shows the XRCF's large vacuum chamber with the Chandra high-resolution mirror assembly installed near the source end of the chamber during preparations for the ground calibration. This chamber is large enough to hold any payload that could be carried by the space shuttle. In fact, Chandra was, uh, I believe, the longest payload ever carried by the space shuttle, and uh, it was carried by the space shuttle Columbia. The XRCF has been used for testing X-ray and also visible light optical systems for several projects, most recently for the cold mirrors of the James Webb Space Telescope to be launched in 2018. One of the most studied celestial objects in every spectral band is the Crab Nebula. This is the remnant of a supernova explosion that was observed in 1054 by Chinese astronomers. In this composite image of the Crab Nebula, red and yellow indicate visible emission observed by the Hubble Space Telescope. Purple indicates infrared emission observed by the Spitzer Space Telescope. And the blue is X-ray emission observed by the Chandra X-ray Observatory. While many supernova remnants are powered by the original explosion, the Crab Nebula is powered primarily by the pulsar, a rapidly spinning, highly magnetized neutron star. This neutron star is the collapsed core of the pre-supernova star and has a density similar to that of an atomic nucleus, about 100 trillion times denser than water. The X-ray image in blue most clearly shows the pulsar wind nebula. These X-rays are emitted by highly relativistic electrons spiraling in the magnetic field. The pulsar wind nebula emits this so-called synchrotron radiation across the electromagnetic spectrum, from radio to infrared and visible to X-ray and gamma ray. However, as electrons emitting the X-rays and gamma rays lose energy more quickly, the nebula is more compact at the higher energies, which is why the blue does not fill the full uh, nebula. The next image is that of the X-ray emission alone. And we see the complex structure of the pulsar wind nebula. And I should emphasize that in X-rays, only Chandra can observe this structure because of its excellent resolution, its ability to see objects that are closely spaced together. The rapidly rotating pulsar, which is represented by the white spot in the center, drives a relativistic wind into the surrounding nebular material, creating a so-called termination shock, which is the inner ring, which feeds synchrotron-emitting electrons to the surrounding torus and the remainder of the nebula. Adding to the complexity of the pulsar wind nebula is the jet, or the tail, toward the lower left. The final graphic is an X-ray movie of the Crab Pulsar Wind Nebula, comprised of Chandra images obtained over a seven-month period. This movie illustrates that the structure of the pulsar wind nebula is not only complex, but quite dynamic. Chandra images exhibit significant changes near the inner ring, and I can see, think you can see the material moving outward, on timescales of weeks, 
and in the torus and jet on time scales of months to years. The sex ray studies of the crab benefit not only from Chandra's exceptional imaging, but also from the longevity of the mission as we are now in our 15th year. Next, Julie will tell you a little about Chandra studies of supermassive black holes. Julie? Thank you very much. Um, so I started using Chandra back in 2009 uh, when I moved to the University of Cambridge for my PhD. And since then, Chandra has really uh, played an important part um, in my research, which has been to study supermassive black holes. So the question you can ask is, how do we actually use Chandra to study supermassive black holes? And to um, actually, if you think about it, black holes, as the name indicates, um, uh, are objects for which gravity is so strong that nothing can escape, not even light. So how can we use X-rays and hence Chandra to study these objects? To show you this, I'm going to use uh, the next animation, which will be shown uh, should be shown right now. Uh, so this animation uh, illustrates the galaxy, and what we're doing here is we're actually zooming in towards the central parts of this galaxy. And we're zooming in so much that we're going to focus on a tiny region that's about a billion times uh, smaller than the size of the galaxy, so really tiny. And what do we find? We find a supermassive black hole. So we think that all galaxies, at least all the massive galaxies, harbors uh, one of these monsters at its center. Um, and so what's interesting in this picture here is uh, we're, what we're witnessing is the presence of an active supermassive black hole in the sense that it's a black hole pulling in matter and slowly consuming it. And when this happens, what's interesting is that the matter gets uh, heated up to very high temperatures due to friction. And I'm talking about, about 10 million degrees Fahrenheit, so very, very hot. And when matter is this hot, it's going to emit a lot of x-rays. So this is how we use x-rays to study black holes. We use them to study the gas very near the black holes, and this informs on properties of the black holes. Um, now, what's also really interesting and that's shown in this animation, uh, if we zoom out a little bit uh, more, so what we see is a presence of two jets. Um, so these jets here are made of very energetic particles and we often uh, detect them through their radio emission. And what's interesting is that these jets can be powerful, I mean very, very powerful. And I'm going to prove this to you in the next image. Um, so the next image, what we're going to see is uh, an image of two galaxies here. So the galaxies are traced by the pink colors uh, in this image. So please note that the color scaling here is different than the ones previously used. Pink means galaxies here, it's tracing the optical light, whereas the blue means the radio emission. And this is tracing the jet of very energetic particles. So what's happening in this image is that one of the galaxies, the one towards the lower uh, left part of the image, harbors an active supermassive black hole this black hole is generating the jet that we see in the blue colors. And this jet is so powerful that it can not only extend beyond uh, the host galaxy, but it extends all the way out and crashes into the second galaxy, so the second pink blob. Um, and so this is just how powerful a black hole can be. This is what they can do. Um, and in the context of powerful black holes, there's actually a very interesting and maybe one of the most unexpected discoveries Chandra ever made, and this relates to galaxy clusters. So in the next image, what I'm going to show you is uh, an optical image of MS0735, which is a very famous cluster of galaxies. So clusters uh, contain hundreds to thousands of galaxies, and this is shown here in the yellow lights, which traces the optical emission. So these are all the galaxies. Um, but what's actually even more interesting is if you look at the same image, but this time uh, if you overlay the X-ray and the radio emission, so this is going to be the next image, which will appear very shortly. Um, yes, thank you. So what we're seeing here is uh, in blue we're seeing the X-ray emission from the cluster, and in the pinkish colors we're seeing the radio. So again, note the different color scale in here. Uh, and what's really What's really interesting is this image tells us two things. First of all, clusters are very X-ray bright sources, and this is due to the hot intra-cluster gas that lies between the galaxies, which is what we're seeing in blue. But what's also seen is this funny-looking radio jet in the pink colors. And what's happening is that the central galaxy of the cluster harbors a very active supermassive black hole. This black hole is generating these jets, and these jets are so powerful that they can literally push away the hot X-ray gas creating beautiful cavities in the X-ray image, 
and they're filling these cavities with the radio emitting particles. So this is what we're seeing. Now to show you another uh, very nice example of this, we're going to look at the next image, which is the famous Perseus cluster. So this cluster, very famous, um, you see again in the blue colors, you see the X-ray gas, X-ray emitting gas, and the pinkish uh, blobs are the radio emission. So again, we're witnessing uh, a cluster which has uh, a central galaxy with an active supermassive black hole that's generating jets, and this is what you see with the pink blobs. Now, if we look at only the X-ray image, so this would be the next image, you'll see very clearly the cavities I was talking about. So those are the, the, two, the two central cavities that you see around the point source. And so these are being created by the jet. So the jet is pushing away the hot X-ray emitting gas, creating the cavities. Also note the cavity that's in the top right uh, portion of the image. So this is an older cavity, which has risen buoyantly. And Chandra's legacy has really been to uh, discover many of these cavities in many clusters of galaxies. Um, and this has really impacted our understanding of black holes because it shows that black holes have a very important impact on the surrounding medium in many systems, and that if we really want to understand galaxies and clusters, we must first understand black holes. So I'm going to leave it here, and I'm going to pass uh, the mic to, uh, to Scott. So go ahead. All right. Thank you, Julie. I have been part of the Chandra Science Operations team for about 18 years. My group is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the scientific instruments. And my specific roles are pretty varied. In addition to monitoring the scientific instruments, I spend a lot of time helping observers to understand what Chandra can do and how to get the most out of their observation. And I help organize the group of scientists from all over the world who evaluate proposed science and decide what actually gets done by Chandra. Personally, my scientific focus is on star and planet formation. So while the previous speakers have talked about X-rays in terms of some very extreme phenomena, black holes, pulsars, supernovae, and colliding galaxies, and in those images, we've been seeing some of the hottest objects in the universe and really fantastic results. I concentrate on much colder objects. And one of the most surprising results regards some of the coldest objects in the solar system, namely comets. The figure is an image of the comet Ikea Zhang, which passed the Earth in 2002. What we think is happening is that highly charged particles from the sun, which is off to the right about 100 million miles away, stream out in all directions, and some pass through the atmosphere of the comet, which is called the coma. This is essentially full of water molecules, and the positively charged particles from the sun are highly attracted to the elect electrons in the neutral water. They transfer, or you might say steal, electrons from the water as they pass through the comet's coma. The stolen electrons move towards the center of the new particle, and as they do this, they release an X-ray of a very particular energy which we can measure. And in doing this, we identify the exact particle from the sun that stole the electron from the comet. And the shape in this image is caused by the absorption pattern of those particles from the sun passing through the comet. And that tells us both about the sun and about the comet. In addition to comets, almost all the planets in the solar system from Saturn on in have been detected by Chandra, along with a few moons. And the, each one has a different story to tell about what physics is going on in between the sun and the atmosphere of the moon or planet. And while Learning about the sun this way and how the planets interact has been very exciting. I think one of the most tantalizing discoveries has come from something that we didn't know existed when we started building Chandra, planets around other stars, called exoplanets. Just like planets that have been discovered when they block optical light from other stars, we've found that exoplanets can also block X-ray light from other stars. What the slide is showing is both data and an artist's conception of what the light changes in these other stars are telling us. What we see is that as the star gets fainter, well, what we see is the star gets fainter when the planet is in front of it. The big surprise is that the eclipse, which is called a transit, is deeper and wider when viewed in x-rays than in optical light. And what this means, simply put, is that the diameter of the planet at x-ray wavelengths is bigger than the diameter of the planet at optical wavelengths. 
And what that means is above the visible atmosphere is a very large, very thin atmosphere, half again the size of the visible planet. And what we think is going on is that the atmosphere at these altitudes is being boiled off into space by the host star, which is only a few million miles away. And right now there are observations being performed to improve the quality of this data and confirm this hypothesis. And now I'm going to send it back to Megan, who has been getting questions from all the various social media. Thank you, Scott, and thank you to Harvey, Julie, and Steve um, for your excellent presentations. Um, but just to recap before we go to questions and answers, what this Google Plus Hangout is all about. We are here celebrating the 15th anniversary of the Chandra X-ray Observatory, one of NASA's great observatories, which is currently in space and taking fantastic images and other, any other data of, from X-ray sources across the universe. Um, and if you're watching and you want to ask a question of our panelists today, you can use the Ask NASA hashtag, or you can leave a comment on the Google Plus events page um, that is, I believe was circulated through NASA. So please, if you're interested and you haven't already sent your question, please do so. But we do have several questions already, including we'll start with one um, for Harvey, which it says, uh, Harvey, what observation during the whole project um, of, of Chandra's lifetime would you consider the most revolutionary? That's not really a fair question <laughs> because many, many, many of the uh, observations uh, revolutionized our thinking and our understanding of the systems we were looking at. So as a case of uh, each individual probably has his or her favorite area. Uh, to me, in some ways, the most significant was the first formal image that we took, the official first light image, which was a short exposure of the supernova remnant Cas A. And we saw this little dot building up in the center in real time on the screen. Uh, it was a discovery, and, and what was supposed to just be a beautiful picture was a discovery of the central object, the neutron star, presumably, which formed at the time of the supernova explosion. I think it was indicative to me and to those of us perhaps in the room at the time that Chandra was really going to push you know, factors of 10 or 100 beyond what previous X-ray telescopes have been able to do. So in some ways, the, the setting of the tone for the uh, revolution uh, comes from that first light image. A, a very excellent and diplomatic answer. I think that was, that was great. Um, so <laughs> another question came in, and I'll, I'll shoot this to Julie. Um, after 15 years of studying X-ray images of our universe, are there any new areas or things to image? It's an interesting question. Um, so I think that there will always be room for unexpected discoveries for objects that we didn't know about and we just take a picture and then we find something unexpected. Uh, but I think a lot of the science in the next couple of years will come from very deep images of objects that uh, we've already taken pictures of. So for example, the Perseus cluster, if we look at it very, very deeply, we've never reached that kind of uh, quality before, so we don't know what we're going to see. Um, so I think that's maybe where we're headed, is just going deeper and just getting the best that we can and finding something maybe completely unexpected. Um, so Great. we'll <laughs> Thank you. And I have a question here which I'll give to Steve, which is, what was the biggest surprise of any during the building and testing of Chandra uh, before it launched? Biggest surprise, okay. Uh... I guess one uh, thing that disturbed us briefly was the uh, we had difficulties with opening the uh, door of one of our detectors called the ASIS, and that ultimately was resolved, but it was quite worrisome uh, prior to launch. And so we were all relieved on, I believe it was August 12th of 1999, when the ASIS door opened and we started to get the first X-ray photons on the CCDs. So you didn't know between... July 23rd and when it opened on the 12th that it would open? Right. Well, we thought it would open. It had been tested, but we were definitely relieved when it actually did open. I think we all are. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I have a question here about exoplanets, so I'm going to give that one to you, Scott. Uh, and that says, basically, it's, it's well, people in this current generation will be, will be able to see or learn about exoplanets that we might be able to travel to, say, within, you know, it would only take 10 years to reach. Are, are, are there, I, guess, I think the question is, 
are there a group of exoplanets within 10 light years, um, theoretically, that we could reach um, if we could travel at the speed of light that we're learning about now? Like, what are the closest exoplanets we're learning about, or are they all really far away and there's no chance of us ever? Um, you know, in fact, a lot of them are really, really close. Um, I don't have a map inside my head, but for Chandra's purposes, we like them close because if they're close, they're bright, and that's true for all telescopes. So Hubble has looked at a lot of these. The Spitzer Space Telescope looks a lot at the, a lot of these. The one that I happen to show, I think, is a little under, is a little over 30 light years away. So it's a little further than you could get to in 10 years, but it's not. It's not far away relative to the pulsars that we saw pictures of, or the black holes that we saw pictures of earlier. These are really in our backyard. I think the closest one, if I remember correctly, is about 15 or 12 light years away. The, some of them are quite, quite close because you want to look at bright objects to, to see the planet go in front of it. So we actually we look in our nearby neighborhood for them. Great. Thank you. Um, I have an, a question that just came in that really could go to anyone, and so feel free for any or all of you to jump in. Um, what course in college should I take to work in work for NASA or at NASA? Um, what, what course in college should I take? What training should I undergo to fit for a job at NASA? So that I mean, we all know that there's a lot of different kinds of jobs at NASA, but maybe um, you could talk about something that you know, a course or a direction that you might have taken for your particular job. What would you recommend to someone who wanted to follow in your footsteps, so to speak? Well, let's start with Harvey. So. I think uh, physics is very important if you want to do the science. Uh, the astronomy and physics often go hand to hand at different universities and, and things have evolved since I was a student uh, and so probably astronomy or physics are, are great choices if you want to do the science. Uh, there's uh, certainly from an engineering perspective there's probably more opportunities to do engineering work. Uh, the technical software work, there's uh, management. Uh, if you really want to make a difference, figure out how to go to Congress and become one of the influential people that passes the laws, that provides the funding so we can keep doing these projects. Trying to throw up the next generation of politicians. I like it. All right, Julie, what were you going to say? Sorry. Uh, I was just going to say definitely take at least one astronomy course just to make sure this is what you want to do the rest of your life. Um, if you like that course, you're going to like the career. Um, so one astronomy class at least. Steve, what do you say? I uh, tell my kids, uh, do whatever you want. Do something you're good at, something you enjoy, and something you can make a living. <laughs> and there are lots of jobs within NASA that span engineering, science, and management, and um, very other, various other fields. So it depends on what the person is interested. Scott? Yeah, I mean... Myself. Go, go ahead, Steve. I was just going to say, I, I myself, like Harvey, uh, got my degree in physics, and I think in terms of astrophysics, physics and astronomy are pretty much essential. Yeah, I, was, I was basically going to say the same thing. I got my degree in physics. I got my um, PhD in astrophysics, but really take the physics degree and from, in undergraduate, then from there you can see what best suits you. Or, you know, you can do an if you want to work for NASA per se, then it's probably more of an engineering thing. A couple of us on this, most of us here, don't actually work for NASA. Um, it's the the people who don't work for NASA, you know, write the proposals and give the science direction, and then NASA provides the huge engineering infrastructure without which none of it can actually happen. So it's a little bit goes back to what the question is: working for NASA or working on space missions in general. So I think just to add to what everybody said, we're all doing astrophysics with Chandra. Uh, NASA does a lot of science in other areas uh, besides astrophysics. So geology, planets, earth science, uh, studying the oceans and the atmosphere of the earth, uh, uh, the uh, study of the sun and the solar wind. Uh, so there's a, a wide variety of science that uh, I think physics is, is still a good uh, background, but rather than the astronomy side, it's possible that uh, geology or oceanography, atmospheric sciences, they all are things that NASA uh, uh, is very engaged and involved in, so it's a little bit broader than just the astronomy and astrophysics we've been talking about. 
Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, I have one I have a question that came in that I truly don't know the answer to, and I don't know even who directed to. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll throw it out there and see if, it, if we have any takers. Has there been any images from Chandra that completely defied the laws of physics? No. Okay. Easy answer. <laughs> By definition. Yeah. That's what I want. I just wanted to double check. And there's one, this is one is specifically for Harvey, um, but maybe any, any of you can also add to it. Um, what is the next step for X-ray astronomy after Chandra? So the next step for X-ray after Chandra. So the immediate step is to keep Chandra in good shape, good health, and keep it working. And I mentioned in my remarks starting out that the projection is at least for another decade. And that's in part because there are no telescopes on the drawing boards in the U.S. or any place else in the world that have the imaging capability that Chandra brings. Our colleagues in Europe uh, are working, or just at the early stages, of working on a project called Athena, uh, which will have a, a large collecting area, but will not make pictures or have the full sensitivity of, of Chandra. In the U.S., we've been studying at Marshall, at Goddard Space Flight Center, at here at the Smithsonian, and a few other places, how to make uh, mirrors that are just as good as Chandra, but for the same mass as Chandra, perhaps 30 or 50 or even 100 times the collecting area. So we're envisioning something just as good in terms of the image quality as Chandra, but able to see uh, by collecting more x-rays, by being bigger, see things that are uh, either fainter or further away, or the things that Julie was talking about where we would need longer and longer exposures. The deepest Chandra exposure um, in what's called the Chandra Deep Field South uh, is four million seconds worth of exposure time, and it took us between two and three months to accumulate that. With this new mission that we've just begun to study called SMART-X, which stands for Square Meter Arc Second Telescope for X-rays, uh, we could do that thing that took us two and a half months, say, we could do that in a single day. So you can imagine we could do a lot more pieces of the sky, we could do more objects, we could go fainter, we could do better. So all of us are working on the technology and the science case for such a mission. Uh, if all went very well, uh, we could conceivably compete uh, for the uh, top slot in the uh, next decade. Uh, there's usually a review done every 10 years that tries to say what the next mission ought to be. So the next X-ray mission that I think is a true successor to Chandra is something along the lines of Smart X conceivably could fly by the uh, 2030 time frame, which is a good reason to keep Chandra going for another 10 or 15 years. Right, right. And along yeah. those lines, there's a, there was a follow-up question, or a related question, I should say. Um, and So is the real next, what's the ma next major advancement? Is it the mirror? Is it something else that the next generation of X-ray telescope, uh, the, the biggest hurdle, I should say? Is, that the, is it the mirror? Is it other things? The detectors? I think to make a mirror that's a very lightweight, uh, and high-performing mirrors, so the Chandra mirrors are uh, the pieces of glass that comprise those mirrors were nearly one inch thick, and so when you uh, put several of them together, you come up to a few thousand kilograms, which was the amount of mass available to, to launch in those mirrors. Uh, the mirrors that we're looking at now, uh, the thickness of the glass is uh, uh, measured in fractions of, uh, of a millimeter. Uh, so, you know, something closer to a hundredth of an inch or a fiftieth of an inch. And uh, to make the uh, flimsy pieces of glass or whatever material you choose to use, to make them actually perform with high precision is both a science and an engineering challenge. There are definitely advances in the detectors to have detectors with uh, uh, very high performance over the full energy band to get both high quality spectra and good imaging uh, so there are numbers of different uh, uh, technology uh, uh, research projects on the detectors as well, but I think the single most challenging is to make this next generation of, of X-ray mirrors, which is really going to be a technical breakthrough. Right, right, right. Well, yeah, like you said, a great reason to get another 15 years out of Chandra because there's so much we can do. Um, I mean, this next question is about stellar mass black holes, and I'm going to throw to you, Julie. Um, yeah. But it basically is asking how many stellar mass black holes have we found with Chandra? But before you answer that, maybe you could just explain how there are different sizes of black holes uh, that we know about. Yeah, so I was talking mostly about supermassive black holes, so the really big ones that have a mass of at least a million times the mass of our sun, so very big massive black holes. 
Uh, but there are actually uh, very different kind of black holes, which we call the stellar mass black holes. So these are a couple times the mass of our sun, um, up to, let's say, 20 times the mass of our sun. Um, and we know so far of maybe 30 systems uh, in our Milky Way, um, and some of which have been found through their X-ray emission. So the way it works for those small black holes, uh, we think that they come from, well, we know that they come from the death of stars, of very massive stars. And what happens is that sometimes these stars are going to be in uh, binary systems. Uh, so there's going to be this star that just blew up in supernova, created a black hole, and then you have another star that's orbiting uh, around it. And sometimes these two can get so close that the gravity of the black hole distorts the second, uh, the star, and the matter of this star slowly gets accreted onto the black hole. And in the same case as what we saw with supermassive black holes, when a black hole starts accreting matter, this matter is going to get heated up to very high temperatures and it's going to emit a lot of X-rays. So we can find these um, stellar mass black holes in these binary systems through their X-ray emission. Uh, and so we know of about uh, 30, maybe 40 so far, still some to be confirmed, um, but there's a lot of progress there. Uh, the great thing about these systems is that they're much smaller, uh, so they evolve much more quickly and so we can see them changing uh, in our lifetime, so that's very interesting. Um, but uh, yes, I, I think uh, I hope that answers the question. I think that did. Thank you very much. And there, I just wanted to mention there is an elusive, maybe middle category of black holes that is still being discussed, but not proven. Called well, astronomers called them intermediate mass black holes. But that's a another story for another day. Um, yeah. Another question came in, um, and I'll throw this to Steve. Is there anything about the telescope you'd change or improve if you could? Well, obviously, uh, if we get even better resolution, that would be wonderful. Uh, the main thing, however, as Harvey mentioned, is the, the weight, that since the mirrors are an inch thick, it's very difficult to go to higher mass or higher collecting area without uh, going to thinner mirrors, and that's the big challenge that, uh, as Harvey said, Goddard, Marshall, and SAO, and a few other places are working on now. And I think making them lighter would be the best thing. And can you just quickly explain why you want lighter? Is it because, because we have to lift it into the air and into the space, and so it's Yeah, it, it, it's right. We, we have to be able to launch it on a rocket and get it into orbit to get above the Earth's atmosphere to do X-ray astronomy. And so with the lift capabilities of um, various rockets, it's necessary to keep the total mass uh, below some limit, and that means trying to get more, if we want to increase the area of Chandra by a factor of 30, we pretty much have to decrease the thickness by about a factor of 30 of the mirrors. And when mirrors get that thin, they're quite flimsy. So how does one hold them? And that's one of the issues that we're addressing collectively. Great. Thank you. Um, I have a question here that uh, any of you can answer, um, which is, if you know it, which I think you do, uh, where did the name Chandra come from? <laughs> so there was a contest. It was a contest that was uh, run and advertised worldwide uh, that uh, I think we had somewhat over 6,000 entries with uh, different possible names suggested. Uh, the people were asked to uh, write a paragraph uh, explaining why the name they were suggesting might be uh, a good name. Uh, and uh, 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 Rentgen, for example, was suggested because it was a, a person who discovered x-rays but the Germans had already flown a satellite, satellite called the Rentgen Satellite, ROSAT. So even though that name may have been the one suggested the most in the contest, uh, it was essentially not eligible as, as, as a winner. Uh, the name Chandra was suggested by at least a couple of hundred of the 6,000 entries, and we ended up having to use the essays as tiebreakers. Uh, but uh, Chandra Sekar was a uh, very eminent uh, Indian-born American uh, uh, astrophysicist who, uh, as a, uh, uh, I guess, pre-doc uh, or uh, going into his doctoral studies, did calculations including special relativity and uh, quantum mechanics and basically calculated that uh, a white dwarf star could have a maximum mass, which is the so-called Chandrasekhar limit. 
Uh, if you got beyond that, you get into the realm of uh, if a star collapses, and what collapses is more than about one and a half times the mass of our sun. Uh, we now know you make neutron stars and black holes. Uh, so the kinds of things that are pretty uh, bright X-ray sources, the things that we're interested in studying, were things that came out. Well, they didn't come out, but there were things that Chandra's uh, calculations uh, uh, eventually uh, led to us beginning to think about those kinds of objects and, and other scientists as well. Uh, Chandra was his nickname for, for Chandrasekhar. Uh, apparently, in uh, the uh, Sanskrit language, it also means luminous and is used to often describe the moon, so it has a, uh, an astronomical connotation as well. Uh, the contest was actually won by a high school student. There were two winners selected. One was a high school student, and the other was a teacher. Uh, and their prize for winning, besides becoming famous, of course, for naming Chandra, was they got to come to the launch. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, very exciting. And I think it's been a great name. Um, I've got a question here that, again, I will I'll see who wants to answer it. Um, it is. Hang on, sorry. I've got a couple. got a. Um, I, I think that this person is referring to the recent advances uh, that were made with the bicep um, results. It, it basically says, based on the images Chandra has, has gathered, um, does it have any impact on the theories for the beginning of the universe? I think they're asking, is there anything to do with, can Chandra contribute anything to the theory of inflation, you know, you know the latest results, or is that a totally separate um, realm? Any takers? So in terms of inflation, I'm not sure, but in terms of our universe and how our universe is accelerating and expanding, I, it, it can do this, and it can do this with clusters of galaxies. Um, and it does this by essentially finding clusters that are very, very far. And the number of clusters, um, the masses they have, will depend directly on how the universe has expanded and accelerated. And so you can get constraints using that. So it's not really inflation, but it's still, you're getting the bigger picture um, from doing that. And so again, clusters are very bright in the X-ray, and this is why Chandra is very useful for that. And that actually brings up a good point that we haven't, I don't think we've touched on yet, which is that Chandra is really very important in the discussion about dark energy and investigating what dark energy, you know, how it behaves and how it's affected the universe over, you know, the course of the universe. Um, so yeah, that's a very important topic. I'm, I'm glad actually you mentioned that because it's... A, Something that Chandra is, is critical in doing, and we haven't talked about that yet. Um, I'm going to throw this one to Scott, and that is, um, where did it go? Um, it's basically a question of it, how does Chandra affect people in their day-to-day -day life? Is there some technology that it, it impacts them based on Chandra, or is there um, some piece of knowledge that you know it doesn't probably you know, impact on a day-to-day -day decision, but it's sort of, what's the sort of takeaway for the average person who may or may not be necessarily interested um, in the, the finer details of astrophysics? What's, is there a takeaway message that people can, can well, think about when they think of Chandra? Well, I think the takeaway, and this is, this is a personal take, I think everyone else on the panel will have a different version of it, but we, we now have a reality of black holes. There were sort of science fiction concepts in the 60s and 70s. We, have a we, we can see what supernova remnants really look like, really how they act. My, my favorite single image from Chandra, and I'm, I know this was a question earlier, it wasn't to me, but it was the one that Steve showed of the crab. And the reason was, when I looked at that picture the first time when it was taken, I said, that's a drawing, right? I mean, you see the, the swirling, the stuff that's swirling around the pulsar and the jet shooting out and the, the skimming and the, the rings, and it's not somebody's imagination. What Chandra has given us is that's reality. That's really what's out there. And no we can't go to a black hole and we can't go to a pulsar and we can't even go to the nearest exoplanet. But s satellites like Chandra can take us there and show us exactly what it looks like. It looks like we're steering, staring out a, a port of the Starship Enterprise, but no, that's really what we're seeing from Earth 
because we have this spectacular telescope. And a little bro more broadly speaking, NASA's fleet of spectacular telescopes. And they show us that this is the universe we live in. And we're just a small part of it, but we can take in all of it. So that's, like I said, a personal take. I could ask more questions, but I think that's a beautiful way to uh, wrap up this Google Plus Hangout. Um, I do want to take a moment to thank all of the panelists who came here today and who lent their expertise and experience um, to describe the very exciting things that Chandler's been doing for the past 15 years. Um, I want to thank NASA Social Media for helping set this event up. Um, if there are any further questions, I'm sure you can still continue to ask, the, ask them via the Ask NASA hashtag, and we will do our best to answer them as they come in. Um, are there any last comments anyone would like to make, or otherwise we'll just sign up for today? We're good? All right, everyone. Well, thank you. thank you so much. We appreciate it. I appreciate your time, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.